So a setback is any time life doesn't go the way you planned and thought it was going to go and something happens. And then you're going to notice if you just sit there, there will be thoughts that start popping into your mind and there'll be feelings of frustration. There might be feelings of anger. And the stoic response to that is not simply to say, ah, this thought has come in. I'm going to acknowledge and dismiss it. But instead, you're going to manipulate that thought. I don't actually believe in the Stoic gods, but I go about my day as if they existed. So when a setback happens, what's going on? Well, the Stoic gods have decided to challenge me in some way, to test me. And then how do I pass the test? And so from a Stoic point of view, a pandemic is kind of what they've been training for. And now it's a chance to show your stuff, you know, like you're in the big game now and somebody's been coaching you, and now you're going to show what you've learned. Hello, everyone. I'm Larry Weeks. Welcome to another episode of The Bounce Podcast. Today on the show, my guest is William B. Irvine. He is a professor of philosophy at Wright State University. He's the author of seven books, including The Stoic Challenge and A Guide to the Good Life. He has also written for The Wall Street Journal, Huffington Post, Salon, Time, and the BBC. And for the basis of this show, I refer you to his book, The Stoic Challenge, A Philosopher's Guide to Becoming Tougher, Calmer, and More Resilient. Philosophy for William is not just an academic career. I was going to say academic exercise, but he actually lives it. Having adopted Stoicism many years ago, making him somewhat of an outlier in academic community, I do know of another well-known author of Stoic books who's also a philosophy professor, and that's Massimo Piliucci, who also had on this podcast. But the Stoics realized that even though you have limited control over what setbacks you experience, you can develop considerable control over how you respond to them. One of the first century Stoics, Seneca, wrote about the differences between experiencing a setback and suffering from it by changing the perspective of how one thinks of setbacks. And that's the idea we're going to explore. You have probably have heard some form of this quote attributed to another Stoic, Epictetus. We suffer not from the events in our lives, but from our judgment about them. So on this show, we explore that precept with some helpful thought experiments that I encourage you to try after you hear this. We talked to William about how we came to Stoicism, the psychology of setback, and a lot of focus on framing. Specifically, we talk about the test frame. We talk some about negative visualization. But without further ado, here's William. Bill, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here, and I very much look forward to uh, our conversation. Thank you for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's very timely with everything, the world, for all of us in the shared experience of being on lockdown, to have a discussion around stoic philosophy and and some of the psychological tools i will label them i think are very helpful from a standpoint of dealing with setbacks this certainly qualifies for that and you i I just want to go over your bio real quickly you're the professor of philosophy at wright state university that's right in dayton ohio in dayton ohio and and the reason i have on the podcast you are an author of seven books I'm not familiar with all seven, so forgive me, Bill, but you've written The Stoic Challenge, which which I have read, and A Guide to the Good Life. I've read that as well. The seven books, are they all philosophy related? No, and, and it's I just follow my interests. I've got a job sure. where they pay me to think about things I want to think about anyway. Wow, and for great. me, it's, yeah. a, it's an intellectual twofer. If I can think about something and then write a book about it, because then, you know, that counts as credit toward promotion and other things. So I've written a variety of books. There's actually a third Stoic book called A Slap in the Face, which is about the proper way a Stoic would respond to insults. And the first Stoic book was an out. Uh, growth of a book I wrote on human desire. And I would call much of my research, what what I'm doing is I'm treading a path between psychology and philosophy. So I read, these days, I read a lot more psychology than philosophy. And what I've done in my Stoic books 
is I've applied, there's two ways you can think of it. One is that I've applied a modern psychological principles to ancient philosophy. The other, I think more correct way to put it is the ancient Stoics came across these techniques, uh, these psychological techniques that have only been rediscovered by modern psychologists and studied and uh, put, put it, you know, ha- had terminology attached to them. That's only happened in the last half century. So uh, I regard myself as sort of an outlier in philosophy in that uh, psychology plays a much bigger role in, in what I do than is the case with most philosophers. This is a good point. I've been trying to come up with a different terminology for some of the principles I'm using or the, some of the psychological tools I'm using from Stoicism because I don't know. It seems to, when you use the word Stoicism, Stoicism, all of a sudden now you have to give some kind of context in kind of that ancient wisdom, which is fine, but the philosophy has been brought forward. It has been pulled into evidence-based science to, to a degree, specifically CBT, so cognitive behavioral therapy, rational emotive therapy. So These are modern tools that people talk much less about, if at all, that has been placed into a therapeutic setting where it's showing effectiveness, but then it's it's kind of dismissed because it's in a therapeutic setting. And I think people don't want to think, well, I'm I'm doing some form of therapy on myself. I I I don't know, but it is the tools that the Stoics kind of outlined and, and discovered and written about. And I think Stoicism is kind of broken out into mainstream, but there's still this label that I don't know why it bothers me. Yeah, the words do get in the way. And when you talk about stoicism, first thing is it's easy to go through life never encountering it. I was a philosophy major in college and I was exposed to to the stoics, but to their logic. Their philosophy of life was regarded as kind of an outlier. It's a thing they worried about when they weren't doing logic, when in fact the opposite was the case. The idea was a serious philosopher is not going to be interested in these questions of uh, how to have a better life and certainly not going to be interested in psychological techniques you can use to do that. Then the second thing I've noticed is when people do encounter stoicism, they already have an impression of it and it's the wrong impression. And what they think it is, is that you just uh, grin and bear it. You just, uh, and you try to bottle up your emotions and you try to stand there and take a cold shower and have people insulting you and you just, uh, you just don't express anything in, in response. But that's wildly off the mark. And so when somebody does, when, when you tell somebody, and I don't go around announcing to people that I'm a, I'm a Stoic, but if somebody you know, says, well, what do you write about? And I say Stoicism. Then the first hurdle is you've got to work through the misconceptions they're going to have about it. And it's interesting because when you get to the other side of that, they realize, oh, well, actually, that sounds kind of useful. And it is useful. So, you know, you talk about self-therapy. It's really a a better way to put it is what you're doing is you're uh, managing your own psychological state. Because, you know, you have this triune brain, you have this higher brain function mapped or wrapped around a mammalian brain, wrapped uh, around a reptilian brain. And unfortunately, those two inner components, the reptilian brain is reflexive, the mammalian brain is highly emotional, and uh, daily on, an, on a minute-by-minute basis, you have to deal with those two internal brain components. and. I like to think of it, imagine that you were being quarantined in a very small apartment and you weren't allowed to go outside at all. And you had to have two roommates in this apartment. And one was this emotional being who would just break into into anger or into grief or into regret on the slightest opportunity. And then the other was just this reflexive being that was capable of, of becoming incredibly angry. Uh, responding in dramatic fashion to whatever happened. Now, if you wanted to survive the quarantine, you have to learn ways to deal with these inner beings. And the thing is, you can't use reason to deal with them because neither is capable of reasoning. But what you can do is you can manipulate them. You can find interesting ways to manipulate them. So switching from the metaphorical you in quarantine, you spend your life dealing with these two internal components of your brain. You know, this is all a function of evolutionary psychology. It's how your brain came to happen. It grew in stages 
And when a new a part came o- along, the old parts didn't go away. They're still there. So you have to spend your life dealing with these components and they, they are capable of making you absolutely miserable. The way the two roommates I just described could make your life absolutely miserable. So you need to be clever about it. You can't reason with them. So what do you do? You use psychological techniques to deal with them. And the Stoics stumbled across many of these very interesting techniques. This would have been more than 2,000 years ago. So I view Stoicism, I mean, the primary thing that interests me is their logical insights and the remarkable extent to which those insights, it's 2,000 years. Hey, guess what? We're the same kind of being as we were then. Yes, we've evolved, but we've got the same brain. We've got the same issues to deal with. And those insights still ring true to this very day. Yes, I've had Dr. David Burns, one of the pioneers in cognitive behavioral therapy on early, early on the the podcast. And, you know, we talked about the roots of CBTs, uh, stoicism, and he he even went further back into Buddhism. And I have keen interest in uh, secular philosophical aspects of Buddhism. And to me, they, they are all in the same pool, albeit the labels kind of get in the way. And as I said, not only stoic wisdom kind of survived, but is now thriving, it has been brought into our century via these psychological tools and different forms of therapy. So to the point, it's been very helpful for me, specifically CBT and, and stoicism and, and some of these other practices. A lot of times I found when I, when I talk to people, there's some events or event or circumstances where someone seeks out answers, specifically and a setback occurs or, or, there, or there's something, there's some form of psychological suffering, albeit however small or large. What was your journey to the discovery of Stoicism? And I'm using the term discovery loosely since you study philosophy. I had what seems like a minor midlife crisis, but it was an unusual midlife crisis. And then I also had it in my mind that what I was going to do is become a Zen Buddhist. I was going to start practicing Zen Buddhism. And then I told you before about this notion of a two for a two for the price of one. So I thought, oh, well, here, here's, here's the opening. Then what I'll do is I'll do the kind of research that anybody would do if they wanted to be a, um, a Buddhist, a Zen Buddhist and take it seriously. And I'll get a publication out of it too. So that was um, the book, the first book I did with Oxford University Press called On Desire why we want what we want. And I went into that book thinking, okay, this is where I'm going to find out about Zen Buddhism. But to be complete, I have to put it into the proper framework. And that is, what are the competitors to it? And what is this all about? And so it dawned on me that there are a bunch of different philosophers and philosophy slash religions that are all attempting to provide you with a philosophy of life, or you could also call it a philosophy of living. And this is something most people lack, but it's something most people should have. It's something all people should have. Philosophy of life gives you two things. First is it identifies for you what the most important thing in life is. It identifies the goal at which you should be directing your efforts. And the interesting thing there was I found that Zen Buddhism and Stoicism both share the same goal, and that is this, this notion of living a life that's as free as possible of negative emotions. So you should experience tranquility. And that's a, a word easy to misuse because that doesn't mean you're, you're emotionally numb. It means that you are experiencing very few negative emotions but you're embracing positive emotions. And then just one more clarification there. And tranquility uh, is different from pleasure. So we aren't thinking in terms of seeking pleasure. But we're interested in these beautiful little sorts of emotions. My favorite is delight. The ability to take delight at all of the little treats life has to offer. Uh, We live in an incredible universe. And the people we know are some incredible human beings. We're all flawed, but you know, relationships are incredible things. And isn't it wonderful that we can have them? But back to the story. 
So I realized first insight is the Stoics were aiming at the same thing as the Zen Buddhists were. But then I also realized that if I wanted to practice Zen Buddhism instead of merely write about it, it would take considerable effort on my part. I would have to do mindfulness training. I would have to wait for my moment of a profound insight when it all became clear. Sometimes that moment could happen the first week I started my Zen practice. Maybe, on the other hand, it would take decades for it to happen, and it might never happen at all. Now, there's Zen Buddhists listening to this. I know you're going to correct me, and I know you're going to say I've misunderstood it. So it turns out to be a doctrine, like any doctrine, where there are many different interpretations, but this was uh, the interpretation I uh, took away. Now, the Stoics, aiming at the same goal, have a radically different way to pursue that goal. And so if uh, you ask them, should, should you do mindfulness training? They'd say, no, 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 here's a better idea. Try this little technique. It's called negative visualization. And we can talk about this. We can develop this at more length if you want to. But let me just uh, sort of lay it on the table as an example. Uh, so here's how you do it. You imagine that you've lost something that you value. And you allow yourself to think about that for a few seconds. And then you get back to whatever it was you were doing before. And the interesting thing is, it'll reframe your existence. It'll encourage you to stop taking for granted the things of your life that because they're there, you take for granted. So I gave Stoicism a try. I tried some of the techniques and I realized It was easy and it worked. Now, if you want to give Stoicism a try, hey, a three-day weekend or three days of quarantine, you know, (laughs) so this is a wonderful time to give it a try. And at the end of those three days, you will know. You will know whether it's working for you. You will will have an idea of what it is. There are no deep mysteries in Stoicism. It, it, in in Zen Buddhism, there are deep mysteries. You know, what is it, the sound of one hand clapping? Yeah, I would also like to interject that the two aren't incompatible in this sense. And by the way, Zen Buddhism is a variation of Buddhism practices yes. in, in general. So I'm just going to use the word Buddhism from a standpoint of mindfulness. Some of the practices I do with meditation, to me, they're not either or. They, they can work together in the sense they do for me some of the practices of Buddhist philosophy. And then the precepts of, of Stoicism. I agree right. with that in, entirely. So it isn't either or. Let me describe an interesting angle on that because I did, you know, Sam Harris uh, does his podcast and he does his Waking Up podcast. And I was a guest on that. And uh, as soon as he became aware that I wasn't doing meditation, he promptly said, Well, you should, and sent me <laughs> uh, his own program and meditation. And I tried it. And I get it. I see the point. So one of the first things to realize in meditation is what you phrased as your monkey mind, that the extent to which you don't think things, instead thoughts happen to you. And the mystery is how could that happen? And like we were talking about before, the thing is you have a very complex brain and it still has these primitive components in it. And the thoughts that come to you, some of them are... um, are bad thoughts, dangerous thoughts, but some of them are these moments of of inspiration, these moments, you know, where your muse, you know, kind of takes pity on you and says, okay, here's the deal. You know, the the two paragraphs you've been working on for the last hour, you got to switch the order and then it's going to work fine. So one thing is to realize that your conscious mind is like the screen of your cell phone it tells you, you know, stuff pops up and you're aware. Oh, look, uh, somebody sent me an email. You have no idea how it got there. I mean, if you're, uh, unless you're a computer engineer, and even if you are, probably you, you understand bits and pieces of it. You don't understand the whole, the whole thing. So that's how your mind is. There are all these deeper things at work, and then they will occasionally say, hey, let's throw out on the screen. That is, let's throw into the, the conscious mind the following thought. Then you have an interesting thing because in meditation, one of the things you learn is how to simply dismiss that thought. You, you, you uh, acknowledge its existence and then you dismiss it. Stoicism 
you're also going to become a spectator regarding your own thoughts. You're going to watch them come into your mind. And the Stoics have a slightly different approach. You don't just acknowledge them and dismiss them, but you try to sabotage them in a way. So in the book, The Stoic Challenge, I describe, for instance, a setback. So a setback is any time life doesn't go the way you planned and thought it was going to go and something happens. And then you're going to notice if you just sit there, there will be thoughts that start popping into your mind and there'll be feelings of frustration. There might be feelings of anger. And the stoic response to that is not simply to say, ah, this thought has come in. I'm going to acknowledge and dismiss it. But instead, you're going to manipulate that thought. So in the stoic challenge, for instance, I describe how you can take that thought that popped in or that setback and turn it around and turn it into it and, and frame it as a challenge, not as a setback, but as a challenge. And I've got this whole psychological apparatus I've set yeah. up where, where you imagine that it's the stoic gods. I don't actually believe in the stoic gods, but I go about my day as if they existed. So when a setback happens, what's going on? Well, the stoic gods have decided to challenge me in some way, to test me. And then how do I pass the test? I do two things. First, I find a successful workaround for whatever the setback was. And second, I don't lose my cool in the process of doing so. If you think about most setbacks you experience in life, what causes you harm is not the setback itself. It's the, uh, the flood of emotions that are released by being set back. Yes because you you mentioned it in the book that the goal for the Stoics was not to remain calm while suffering a setback, but rather experience a setback without the suffering that might follow, specifically emotional suffering. And and there was a a big difference in that. There's kind of the first order and the second order from a setback. In other words, the actual setback or the event, but then you go in to point out a lot of times the emotional response to that is worse than the actual event. If I can interject there, there's a difference between suppressing a negative emotion, and not even allowing the negative emotion to arise. So so that's the the difference there. And I describe in the the book, sort sort of tongue-in-cheek, the five-second rule, that from the time you're set back, within the first five seconds is the golden opportunity, because then you can frame that however you want. But if you wait, then the emotions are going to emerge and you're going to find yourself angry. And once anger gets out of the box, it's very difficult to put back in. In fact, sometimes it's impossible. Uh, you can be angry about things that happened years and years and years ago. So you repackage the setback. You can say, no, this isn't just a bad thing that happened to me. This is a challenge. And I'm going to show the world who's in charge here because the parts of this challenge I can control. And that is, I'm going to do my best to find a workaround to it, and I'm not going to allow myself to get upset. If I can do that, I've done what I could. And that's an A. That's an A grade on that setback. And you know, one of the things that a Stoic will do who takes these setbacks seriously, it isn't just that you'll be, when they come along, you'll be responding to them. You'll actually take on challenges. You will do things that are hard to do simply for the setbacks that you'll be exposed to. And so from a stoic point of view, a pandemic is kind of what they've been training for. And now it's a chance to show your stuff, you know, like you're in the big game now and somebody's been coaching you and now you're going to show what you've learned. But as setbacks go, this one is really relatively minor. I mean, if you look at the curveballs life can throw at us, you know, we've still got food to eat. We're still warm. We've still got electricity. We've got the internet. I know I've had more face-to-face contact with friends than I did before the setback, mm-hmm. just because mm-hmm. you talk to them on Zoom uh, through, the, uh, through the internet. So uh, it's a challenge, but life is capable of much more dramatic challenges than this. I think that's another tool that you kind of outline in the book, I, in a way, Specifically, I'm going to use the word perspective, the tool of perspective. In other words, how much worse could this be? And it could be much, much worse. And again, I'm not minimizing whatever, you know, someone losing a job because of this or even their 
maybe coming down with, with some of the symptoms or, or the virus itself. So I, I'm not minimizing. I'm just saying in almost every situation, if you can reflect on how could this be worse, there is that reframing. You talk about in the book, which is interesting, and, and I'm sure people have used it during this time of pandemic, is and I don't want to overuse these examples because then they become trite to just, just by overuse. But when London was being bombed in, in Second World War. I think people hear that. It's a story, it's history, yeah. whatever. But if you could really put yourself in those shoes where you're not only locked in, but your life is in jeopardy every day or every evening when that bombing raid took place. Hitler was trying to break the will of the people in England and in London. So again, it sounds a bit simplistic, but we are not being bombed. And, no, and, and it, it and, could be worse. Right. right. Uh, so here's a, a, an interesting coincidence. So a week ago, uh, so, you know, now that w we've learned the technology of Zoom and so on, we've been getting in touch with old friends. My wife got in touch with her pen pal from 60-ish years ago, right? A long time pen pal. It's a woman who lives in Scotland. And so we were comparing, you know, what, what is your lockdown like there? What can you do? And, you know, you hear in different places do things differently. And she brought up the Blitz and she said, you know, here we are. And yes, it's bad to have to be in your apartment and, uh, and maybe you can go out on walks, but you can't go to theaters. And she said, her mother said, her mother told her, during the Blitz, you know, when the Germans were on a nightly basis bombing London and, and parts of Britain, you know, it would have been a luxury to stay in your little apartment because what did you have to do? You had to get out of your apartment. You had to go to an underground shelter. You had to spend the night with hundreds of other people lying in a makeshift fashion there, probably hearing bombs detonating around you. And if you were lucky, you got to leave the shelter in the morning. And if you were lucky, when you got back to your apartment, it was still there. So I'm not trying to belittle what people are going through right now. But I think one of the, the biggest things in life is to realize that the good things are never as good as they seem at the time, and the bad things are never as bad. And that by allowing yourself to consider how things could be worse. You're actually going to be making your time easier spent under yes. the conditions you're in. And you, you just mentioned it, but we have a built-in resilience mechanism in the sense that we adapt. In other words, when we take for granted, so if we have food and indoor plumbing and all these good things, we adapt to them and we don't appreciate them much. But that tendency of adaptation also applies to difficult things. We don't realize that we could adapt the same mechanism that allows us to kind of ignore the, the beauty around us would also help us adapt with something that's very difficult. I remember I, I did a commute two hours a day. And when I first started, I didn't plan on doing the commute. And I was like, it was horrible. It was like the worst commute. You know what? I wound up doing it for seven years because I adapted to it. My father was uh, raised during the depression and he would tell me stories and they got so old, you know, he, yep. he didn't have shoes. Literally, he didn't have shoes till he was in junior high and he was raised on a farm. It seems to me when I say, look, if we were in the sequester just 10 years ago, let's say 15 years ago, it would be much worse because of yes. the lack of bandwidth. We would have no video conferencing. Yes. <laughs> so just if, if I bring people a little closer to home, you know, it tends to on and then the, okay, this could be, yeah, much worse. But yeah, and if you want to, I mean, to put it again into historical, two ways you can go. You can put it into geographical perspective or you can put it into historical oh, that's perspective. Good. That's good but yeah. compare your, your life with that of your great great grandparents. If you could somehow bring them forward in time and have, have them stay with you for a while, they would imagine that they were in heaven. They would see all of these magical devices, you know, your cell phone, all of the things you take for granted, microwave, oh, flush toilet, oh, running water, what, it's safe to drink? And if you complained about any of it, you know, they would look at you like you're crazy or the geographical component. Imagine yourself flashed to some African country where for people who can get paid $3 a day to do labor, hard labor in the hot sun. For them, that's a good day. 
and then imagine, compare that to your own, uh, your own life. So the comparison is not meant so you can gloat or feel superior or anything like that, but there's this thing called hedonic adaptation, which you were referring to. Whatever you've got, you will start taking for granted. And then once you start taking it for granted, you will cease to be able to extract joy from the thing in question. And this is true of your job, your living circumstances, your, your car, your children, your spouse, you name it, any aspect of life. And the Stoics realized that and they decided that one of the things you needed to do is a device that would allow you to avoid taking things for granted and negative visualization, which I described before, is one such trick. It's such an easy little psychological trick. And yet what you do is you reset yourself. And if you imagine that your spouse, you know, you get, a, you get that terrible phone call and, you know, and then you realize, guess what? I don't have that spouse anymore. You don't dwell on such thoughts because that would be a recipe for misery. But you allow yourself to have a flickering thought about that. And then watch what happens next time you encounter the spouse, you know, because you, you'll no longer be taking him or her for granted. And it'll be like this wonderful ray of light shining into your day that you get to have more time with this incredible person. When I'm talking before an audience, I'll have, you know, I'll invite them to do a, a brief negative visualization exercise. And I let them choose, but I say it's something that's important to you. And I want you to imagine, I want you to kind of visualize, right? Because that helps the imagination process uh, losing it. And now, okay, uh, exercise is over. Guess what? It's still part of your life. And it's just interesting. You connect to it differently. Another stoic exercise is what I call the last time exercise. There will be a last time for every single thing you do in life. There'll be a last breath that you take. There will be a last time you kiss your spouse. Now, again, that sounds like a recipe for really negative, depressed thinking, but it, uh, strangely enough, uh, has the exact opposite. Because then, when you're going through the motions of everyday living, you realize, you know, this thing that I'm doing right now that I'm, I'm really not enjoying this could turn out to be, in fact, this probably will, if you live long enough, turn out to be the good old days. What am I doing? Well, I'm going to the grocery store to get some groceries. And, you know, again, you know, this pandemic <laughs> has forced us to do stoic exercises that, you know, stoics would have said, you know, you should have been doing them all along to prepare well, for this. One of the things I thought of is the next time we're stuck in traffic, when, when the country opens up and there's traffic. I'm thinking to myself, so this is a sign of the health. If I'm in stuck in traffic, that means something good is happening. In other words, we're out. We're not afraid. We've got a vaccine, something. In other words, normally we're very upset being stuck in traffic or waiting in line or being in crowds, but that is actually a sign of a healthy economy or a healthy country. Right? Sure. And so, one silver lining to the pandemic is that it's going to reset our hedonic standards. I and hope so so yeah. there will be a time after it ends when you get to go back to a restaurant. By the way, the last time I went to a restaurant before, you know, everything closed up and it was just easy to do because there were growing signs that things were going to close. But I sat there in the restaurant and I had the thought of this could be the last time mm. I eat in a restaurant, in this restaurant forever, because, you know, the restaurants could close. But as a result, it's interesting. When you, when you do something with that frame of mind, instead of simply going through the motions of doing it, you embrace the experience, you know? Because if, if somebody told you, okay, this is the last time, you know, changing diapers. Ah, man, if you got kids, what a disaster that is. And you go through, what, several thousand of them. But suppose somebody said, okay, here's the deal. This next one, this is going to be the last time you change a diaper because your kid will have outgrown that stage. Your kid will move on. And, you know, just the idea, will you ever look back and say, gosh, you know, if only I could be at that moment in time in my life again. But that's true of most of the moments. Right now you have your health, you, you're of a certain age and it can all go away and it someday will all go away. So enjoy it while it's here. Savor the moments of your life instead of just going through the motions. And that's a good point because 
everything could be the last time, just from a standpoint of you're, you're not guaranteed the next day. I wanted to kind of circle back to what you started with, and that is the, the very useful passages in the book when you talk about stoic framing and, and this whole idea of frames. When life presents us with a setback, there are many ways to explain it or many different frames in which to place that setback. And, and you, you go into a lot of different exercises or thought experiments on kind of using the framing effect to kind of characterize a situation and how we respond to it emotionally. One of the things you mentioned is that you could have the, the victim or kind of the hero frame. In other words, you're being tested as a hero or you can think that the universe is against you and a victim and your response to setback based on those two frames will vary widely as far as to how you suffer. But you did mention this early on, which I thought was great, and I've used it, and that is the testing frame. Could you just elaborate more on that? On yeah, that? Let, me, let me make a quick comment about sure, the, sure. Um, the, the victim frame. Uh, whenever life uh, deals you something that you feel you don't deserve, you have two different ways you can approach it. You can play the role of victim or you can play the role of target. Victim, that means you want the world to pity you and you expect somebody to do something for you. Target is more an active thing. You say, you know what, this thing that happened to me, it's because somebody out there is treating me in an unfair fashion. And what am I going to do? I'm going to rise to the challenge. What does that mean? Number one, I'm going to look for a workaround. And number two, I'm not going to let that bastard upset me. Because you know what, if he does, he wins. That's the payoff for him. It's also true when somebody insults you. What is the damage an insult does to you? In many cases, an insult is just noise. It's like when a dog barks at you. It's just noise. But you can turn that into something that has a serious price, and that is if you allow yourself to get angry about it, if you lose sleep because you've allowed yourself to get angry about it. So it's something you have control over. You can't control whether other people insult you. You can control your response to the insult. The idea with challenges, what you do is you take them as a kind of test and your goal is to respond to them as positively as you can. So you're going to be very clever in thinking about a workaround. You're not going to sit there and wallow and say, somebody fix this for me. You're going to say, ah, I'm going to rise to this challenge. I'm going to show the stoic gods what kind of stuff I made out of. So it's, it's like thinking of a coach or a teacher. What will a good to, a coach do? A good coach will toughen you up and give you what you need to discover depths and strengths that you didn't even know you had. Yeah, it's being on, on display, like somebody is watching you. Yes. Okay, here's the test. What are you going to do? We're watching. Yep, um, and I have, I have a variety of jokes about that, 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 that the stoic, and again, this is all imaginary but that a lot of the Stoics hang out in airports because, you know, if you're traveling, there are all the setbacks that come with travel. A lot of the Stoic gods hang out in airports because oh. that's <laughs> oh, the source of travel. The Stoic gods are also tech savvy because you get on your computer and then you've got this terrible glitch and you have to spend the rest of the morning. So, you know, you can either just take those as, uh, as excuses for being annoyed about the world. Or you can reframe them and you can say, no, 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 no. This is a chance for me to show what I made of. It's just a night and day difference. I was wondering if the, how much the book of Job was informed by that aspect of Stoic philosophy, where, you know, the story Job was this righteous man upright and God and the devil made a bet or the devil made a bet with God. You know what? He's just worshiping you because everything's going good and yep. you're good to him. Who, who wouldn't be like that? Take it away and let's see. I bet you, you take it away. And God says, okay, go ahead. And, you can't touch his life. Take everything away. We'll see. I mean, that's the book of Job. It's, this it's, whole a, it's a very strange part of the Bible. And, and the, what, what's really, really strange is at the end, you know, you've had this whole thing, you know, that uh, Job loves you only because of what you do for him, right? And then he says, yeah, no, 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 no. Look, watch this. Watch what he does. And then how does the story end? Oh, he gets a reward from God for having gone through all this. So at some deep level, it doesn't seem quite coherent. But he did take it. I mean, stoically in kind of the traditional sense, he just said, you know, this is um, my fate and here's what uh, I've befallen. But a stoic puts a positive spin on it. 
he, he doesn't just accept it. He puts a positive spin on it. Ah, this is a test. The pandemic for a Stoic, it's a really, really interesting test. And it's a long-term test, but it's a test. So I've got a, a, a line that cannot be traced to uh, the Stoics, but I, I mentioned it in the, in the, the book. Uh, and it could be the Stoic slogan for times like these. Uh, so what's the secret to getting through? Simple. You do what you can with what you've got where you are. Those few words, what you do, what you can with what you've got where you are. Because that's all you ever can do. And you know what? If that's what you did, you can walk away a winner. You did what was possible to do. And, you know, if somebody says, well, why didn't you do the impossible? Well, because it's impossible. But I did what was possible to the best of my ability. And I'm proud of that. And that's an accomplishment. And so that's something for people to think about in these times. You know what? That seems like a good spot to end. Thank you for that. So our audience can find you on your website, William Irvine. William B. Irvin, B William and B. Boy. William B. Irvin.com. And yeah, I'd link to everything there. And there's stuff they can read. There's stuff about uh, the pandemic they can read, past podcasts I've done, a lot of stuff. You mentioned a book, The Slap. What was that? A Something Slap like... in the Face. That's uh, three or four books ago. Oh, uh, yes. And, and the interesting thing is, I'm not quite sure it ever quite found its, its, uh, its market, but it was supposed to have been the stoic book that I wrote that would really appeal to a wide audience. But it turns That's out that Guide to the Good Life is the one, and it, that came out 12 years ago, not only appealed to a, a wide audience, but still does to this day. So it's a nice entry to Stoicism in that it kind of lays out the Stoic ideas in a non-scholarly way and then uh, has actionable advice. Bill, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for asking me. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed it, do share it with your friends and on your social platforms. Big thanks to Sam Williams, my audio guy, and the beautiful bumper music you're hearing is Michael Petrovich's Bella Luna. For all my show notes or resource links, visit LarryWeeks.com, and we will talk again soon. Mm-hmm.